I thank all of our guests. And it's now time for question period. The member from Nipissing. Thank you, and uh, good morning, uh, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Good morning, Premier. You and I both attended the Ontario Economic Summit in Niagara recently. At that conference, the Ontario Chamber of Commerce released an alarming assessment of your government's performance. Their guide, titled How Bad Is It?, confirms Ontario has an unsustainable structural deficit. Yep. They confirm that Ontario, quote, Ontario's fiscal situation is becoming increasingly dire. The Chamber's report says interest payments will, quote, further crowd out capacity to spend on programs like health, education, and transportation. Premier, will your fall economic statement continue to show your deficit of Question. ideas, your deficit of action, and your deficit of hope? Or will it address what the chamber says is a clear case for urgency? Well, Mr. Speaker, I appreciate the question from the uh, member opposite, and I, given the tone and tenor of the question, I'm sure he is very, very pleased to know that on my recent trip to China, we have come back with a billion dollars worth of investment for Ontario. there is an urgent situation in Ontario. We know, Mr. Speaker, and we ran on a plan that addresses that urgency, Mr. Order. Speaker. We ran on a plan that makes the investments that we know are necessary, that sets up the partnerships that allows for the growth that we know is necessary. And as part of that plan, Mr. Speaker, has an international, a global trade strategy yes, that allows us to bring investment to Ontario in order to grow as we know we need to, to deal with the structural issues that we face, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Thank you uh, Premier. The Chamber's annual survey shows business confidence in Ontario is eroding. And here's what else they had to say. The number of businesses who believe Ontario is restoring the fiscal balance is down. Investing in innovation and competitiveness, down. down. In building a modern workforce, down. down. A perfect example of liberal mismanagement is, is uh, one of the Chamber's key priorities, the Ring of Fire. Last week, the CEO of Cliffs Resources said there is, quote, zero hope this massive economic opportunity will happen. He cited your lack of leadership and lack of a plan as the reasons why. Premier, the Chamber says you Question. need to, quote, fundamentally change what you're doing. Will you? Thank you, Premier. Well, Mr. Speaker, it's interesting because as I have had the opportunity to work with uh, Premier Couillard in uh, Quebec, and we have been talking about the similarities between uh, the Ring of Fire investment and the, the potential for that, and our commitment to infrastructure in uh, the Ring of Fire Member and the plan Kitchener, Noah, that is in uh, place in Quebec, Mr. Speaker, as we had the opportunity to speak with investors and with uh, businesses in China, Mr. Speaker, who are looking at both Quebec and Ontario as vitally important places to invest, Mr. Speaker. I actually see that there's a very different picture that we paint of the future for Ontario, Mr. Speaker, and that's premised on the reality that right now we Remember are the Renfrew, number one jurisdiction for foreign direct investment, Mr. Speaker. So the, the, member, yes, the member opposite may think that is, it is to the advantage of his con constituents to talk Ontario down. I don't agree, Mr. Speaker. I think we focus on our strengths and we build this problem. Well, Speaker, you brought Ontario down, Premier. The Ontario Chamber of Commerce isn't the only group of job creators who are sounding the alarm. The Canadian manufacturers and exporters released a survey showing 60 per cent of their members do not believe your government is supporting investment and growth. They say high energy costs, the highest in North America, obscure labor shortages make it difficult to compete and develop new markets. They cite the weak financial si situation that you created is a major challenge. Premier, our job creators want a signal from you that things are going to change for the better, but you continue to ignore them. We are committed 
here on this Question. side to create the conditions to make Ontario first premier, why aren't you? Well, Mr. Speaker, it is completely understandable that the, uh, this member, who is a former PC finance critic, would want to distance himself from his policy of cutting 100,000 jobs. It's completely understandable, Mr. Speaker. But let's just look at the facts. Ontario's tax system is one of the most competitive in the OECD. Ontario is the first destination for direct foreign investment in North America, Mr. Speaker, we are number one in terms of direct foreign investment. Seven out of ten of the world's largest technology companies are conducting research and development right here in Ontario, Mr. Speaker. So I take no I take no lessons from the member opposite in terms of what we need to do to grow this economy, Mr. Speaker. Cutting a hundred thousand order. Ten second wrap up. So, creating a jobs and prosperity fund, building transit and infrastructure, the from business, come to Mr. Order. Speaker, those are the things that we are doing. They are bearing fruit. They are bearing success. Thank you. I hope the member opposite will join the join the party, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, uh, Speaker. My new question is also for the Premier. As the former mayor of the City of North Bay, I have spoken strongly about the role of local governments. Last week's municipal elections provide a fresh start to put local governments at the centre of the issues that affect them. The new mayors and councillors need to look beyond their cities and towns because things you do here affect them at home. When you bring an aviation fuel tax, they lose jobs at home. When you bring a pension tax, their chambers tell us that 53% of their businesses are going to fire people to pay for it. The decisions you make with no consultation with local governments are hurting communities. Will you continue to say you consult only to surprise them with a new bill, Premier? Premier? Well, Mr. Speaker, um, there's probably um, I'm going to I'm going to make a, a generalization here, but I think there's probably not a government that has spent more time consulting with yeah. local leadership yeah, right. on a monthly basis, Mr. Speaker. A monthly basis, the ministry, the minister of municipal affairs and housing, and ministers across this government sit down with leadership from the Association of Municipalities of Ontario, Mr. Speaker. They talk about the issues that the municipalities are bringing forward. They talk about legislation that. Is is coming forward, Mr. Speaker. So, in terms of consultation, we work very, very closely with municipalities. And I would just say, Mr. Speaker, many of us here are here on this side of the House because the people on that side of the House were part of a government that imposed, imposed downloading of costs, imposed amalgamations with narrow a word to the leadership in municipalities, Mr. Speaker. We've gone quite Thank in the you. opposite direction. Well, uh, Premier, I know that the facts hurt. You passed the Far North Act without listening to the. Stop the clock, please. Come to order. Uh, come to order. The, member, the Minister of Aboriginal Affairs is warned. Finish, please. You passed the Far North Act without listening to mayors and First Nation chiefs, and as predicted, 80% of the bill are now closed. To order. You say one thing, but you do the opposite. You formed the Ring of Fire Development Corporation with no First Nations on board. You say one thing, you do the other. Today, there are mayors, chiefs, and citizens from Rainy River District here. They chartered a plane and had to hold a media conference to get their message out because they know you're not listening. They're here with a message. It's about forestry. But instead of listening to the mayors and chiefs, you hastily scheduled a news conference at the same time as theirs. Premier, is that Question. your idea of leadership? Premier. Mr. Speaker, I'm very glad that the delegation is here, and I know that uh, my ministers are going to be meeting Minister with from, them. Uh, the member from in Renfrew terms will come of to order. consultation, uh, specifically, the member opposite uh, raised the issue of the Ring of Fire. Um, Mr. Speaker, in fact, we have worked very, very closely with the uh, Matawa First Nations to make sure that there is a framework agreement in place to make sure that First Nations are part of the consultation and the discussion all the way along. And the member opposite knows full well that the 
development corporation that has been set up has been set up in, as an entity that is now going to bring the partners on board to be part of that development corporation. And I would say, Mr. Speaker, it is irresponsible for the member opposite to frame or to, to characterize the development corporation yes, in any other way. It is an entity that is designed to bring in the partners, the private sector, the First Nations government, the federal government, to work towards the development of the Ring of Fire. And he knows that was the case. Premier, you You see it, please? You see it? The member from Leeds Grenville come to order. Final supplementary. Premier, you say you will consult, but you don't. You surprise Ontario with the closure of 10 provincial parks. Again, no consultation. Tourists traveled elsewhere. Communities took the hit. Realizing the impact local municipalities offered to operate the sites themselves, and it worked. Had you only talked openly about your plans in advance, consulted them, there would have been no loss of revenue. Today, you've got chiefs and mayors here from because Anglican you continue to, to create problems for them when they have the solutions. By dealing openly with municipal governments and First Nations, we can make Ontario first. They're right here, Premier. Will you meet with them, or will you continue to say one thing and do the opposite? Okay, Mr. Speaker, I have already said that my ministers are going to be meeting with this delegation. It's very important to me that we have this conversation and that we and that we understand exactly what is going on in all of the communities across the province mr speaker that's why during the election mr speaker i was in the north a lot compared to the leader of the opposition who didn't go north of Barry, mr speaker i have made it my business both as a minister and as premier to go to the north to make sure that i engage with municipalities but i go back to my first point mr speaker we deal with and work with on a regular basis the leadership in municipalities from across this province. Ministers attend the uh, meetings of the local groups. We have an ongoing and monthly discussion with the Association of Municipalities of Ontario. We are engaged fully Answer. in finding solutions to the challenges that municipalities are confronting, Mr. Speaker. The member opposite knows that, and he should. He should be taking Thank part you. in those consultations with us, Mr. Yeah. Speaker. Thank you. Your question, the Leader of the Third Party. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Uh, page 46 of Hydro One's management report, released this February, shows that their distribution network brings in $452 million and before tax profits. My question is a simple one, Speaker. Why is the Premier planning to privatize a public asset that serves 1.3 million customers and puts hundreds of millions of dollars in the provincial bank account annually? Well, Mr. Speaker, let's just go back to the premise of, uh, of the question. And the premise of the question uh, that the leader of the third party is asking is that we should never look at the assets that are owned by the people of Ontario and determine whether they are working to the to the best advantage of the people of Ontario. I just disagree with that premise, Mr. Speaker. I think that it's very important that on a regular basis we look at those assets, we make sure that they, they are working. I made it clear when uh, Ed Clark, who is the expert who is looking with his team at these assets, made it clear that we wanted to retain those assets in, pub in uh, the hands of the, the public, and we are doing that, Mr. Speaker, and that is their advice to us. But should we look at how they can work better? Should we look at them as a package and figure out how yes, to optimize their value? Absolutely, we should, Mr. Speaker. It would be irresponsible to do otherwise. Thank you. Supplementary. Hydro One's distribution business puts money in the provincial bank account every single year that goes into hospitals, schools, all kinds of frontline services for the people of this province. Not only will privatizing Hydro One's local distribution assets cut out a source of revenue, but it will push up the bills, Speaker. That means everyone from local homeowners to businesses will see their electricity costs go up. Privatizing electricity generation made hydro bills more expensive. Privatizing distribution Blair, speaker will do exactly the same thing. So why does the Premier think that ratepayers should be paying more just to pad the profit margins of private energy companies, Speaker? Well, Mr. Speaker, actually, the uh, leader of the third party once again has got it wrong because the, the parameters that we gave to uh, Mr. Clark was that 
The revenue stream that uh, that is already in place, Mr. Speaker, either needed to stay in place or needed to be enhanced because we recognize, as she does, I suppose, that it's very important that that revenue that comes into the uh, the provincial coffers and is used for uh, services to the people of Ontario that that remain whole. And so, if the leader of the third party chose to read the whole speech that Mr. Clark gave and look at the whole interim report, which will come out, she will see that those revenue streams the integrity of those rem revenue streams is whole mr speaker that there is uh, that there is an offset for that revenue that uh, that she's proposing and that in fact that in fact the effects Answer. on the rate base mr speaker will not be negative will actually help people across the province that's right Thank you. Final supplementary. speaker the more you look at the liberal plan the less it makes sense the premier is privatizing an asset speaker that brings in hundreds of millions of dollars annually and they're ignoring the lessons of history speaker privatizing electricity generation made hydro bills more expensive, yeah. not cheaper. Privatizing distribution, Speaker, is going to do exactly the same thing. Now, will the Premier admit that her plan to privatize Hydro One's distribution assets will cost everyone, from homeowners to businesses, higher bills? Mr. Speaker, I would ask the uh, leader of the third party if she then does not agree with her member for Temiskaming Cochrane, who has said that he's written that the Minister of Energy should be encouraged to uh, encourage the OPA to renew the contract for private power that's generated in his own writing. I would also ask the member opposite, the leader of the third party, to explain whether she disagrees with the, her government's policy when it was in office, when they signed nine private power generating contracts, Mr. Speaker. The reality is, the reality is that we have asked experts to look at the assets that are owned by the people of Ontario. We, we uh, have said that we prefer, that we believe that those should be kept in the hands of the people of Ontario, but can they be optimized? Answer. Can we do better in terms of the value of those assets? Yes. We believe we can, Mr. Speaker, and that's exactly what we're going to do. I ask the, the Premier to look at history's lessons, Speaker. That's what I ask the Premier to look at. My next question, in fact, is for the Premier. The craft mill in Fort Francis, Speaker, is at a critical point as we sit in this legislature right now. If the mill gets purchased, it will create a thousand jobs in that community, Speaker. If the mill doesn't get purchased, the current owner will stop winterizing it and the mill may be lost forever. By doing nothing, the Premier will kill a thousand jobs. My question is, why is this Premier putting the interests of one company ahead of a thousand leader. people in the Northwest? Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry is going to want to speak to the specifics, but I want to just say that our government has maintained open lines of communication with the town of Fort Francis since uh, the Resolute announced that they would be idling their Fort Francis operations. Mr. Speaker, there's been a there's been a continuous engagement, and obviously we're disappointed that uh, that this particular arrangement hasn't worked out. But that doesn't mean that we are abandoning the process, Mr. Speaker. It doesn't mean that we are abandoning. The member from the James we Bay, will continue to, to work with the community. We will continue to work for solutions, and the minister is engaged in that on a regular basis. Mr. Speaker, and I believe the leader of the third party knows that. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, the Crossroot Forest is a crown resource. Communities in the Northwest are making a simple request to ensure that forests in the region are sustainably managed to create jobs in the region. With a stroke of a pen, the minister can convert the sustainable forestry license to an enhanced sustainable forestry license so that the community and companies manage that forest together. But the minister has said that nothing is going to happen until 2016. Speaker, that is going to be far too late for Fort Francis. So will the Premier make a commitment right here and now to take action today? Speaker, thank you, and I thank uh, the member for the question. Speaker, the, the premise of the question is that if an enhanced sustainable forest license was in place today, 
If those discussions had started a year ago, and quite frankly, if they'd started a year ago, I still think it's unlikely that one would have been in place today, because the four priority areas that are being worked on still do not have one in place today. Right. But even if it had been in place, there is no guarantee, and the people from Fort Francis are aware of this, there is no guarantee that that in any way would have facilitated a deal, a private sector deal, between two forestry companies. Yes. Speaker, MNDF staff, MNRF staff, and MNDM staff were at the table guiding the process. But at the end of the day, this was very clearly a business-to-business -business relationship. Fundamental to all of this Answer. is that the mill the mill is owned privately. The company is not in bankruptcy. They own the mill. They own the asset, and clearly they're fundamental to any deal coming together on this fund. Order. Final supplement. Speaker, the people of Ontario, the Crown owns the forest. That's the point. Communities across the Rainy River District are asking this Premier and this government to take action. The town of Fort Francis is asking this Premier and this government to take action. Local First Nations are asking this Premier and this government to take action. The Northwestern Ontario Municipal Association is asking this Premier and this government to take action. There are people in this gallery, in the galleries here today, representing the, the Rainy River District. District, and they are asking this Premier and this government to take action. New Democrat Speaker are asking this Premier and this government to take action. Will the Premier finally agree Question. to take immediate action to create a thousand much-needed jobs in Fort Francis? Minister. Speaker, thank you. You know, the member is right. We do end our own the forest, but what she doesn't acknowledge is the system of tenure that exists today is the system that was put in place by the NDP in 1994. Oh! Forest tenure today is the system that they put in place in 1994 under the Crown Forest Sustainability Act. Our tenure modernization in 2011 has begun the process of moving away from that tenure model. First of all, Speaker, unfortunately, it's not my belief or anybody's belief that a thousand jobs would be created. There would be significant job creation with the, if the mill were to reopen, but it wouldn't be a thousand jobs. I'm not sure where that number is coming from. Having said that, I understand completely the emotion that's attached to this decision. We have yes, forestry sir. companies in Thunder Bay. We live the recession, the Minister of Northern Development Mines and myself. We know how important it is. We will continue to work and do anything that we can Thank to you. try and facilitate something yeah, yeah. positive at the Fort Francis Mill in Thunder Bay. Question? Be seated, please. Be seated, please. New question, the member from Halliburton, Council Lakes Brock. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Premier, it has been 24 hours since I asked you to strike an all-party select committee to study sexual harassment in the workplace. Yesterday, you talked about being open to conversations and the need to be vigilant. But those are all vacant words with no commitment to action. What better way to demonstrate this, that this is a serious issue than by agreeing today to strike an all-party select committee to study sexual harassment in the workplace. Premier, when can we expect your decision on this matter? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, in that 24 hours, Mr. Speaker, I have actually taken some action. So what I did was I, uh, I spoke with the, um, with the head of the OPS to, uh, to determine exactly what procedures and protocols were in place. I have that information. I'm happy to uh, share what, that with the member opposite. But, you know, people need to know that there is uh, a workplace discrimination and harassment policy in place that addresses prevention, reporting, and, ha and a workplace discrimination and harassment policy that uh, deals also with uh, violence in the workplace. That is within the framework of the legislation that is in place and the Human Rights Code. The other thing that I did, Mr. Speaker, was I checked within our own Liberal caucus to, uh, to make sure that uh, the policies were in place, and there is, in fact, a policy for ha harassment and violence-free workplace that applies to our Liberal caucus, Mr. Speaker. Answer. So I'd be very interested in the House leaders actually having a discussion about what's in place in the other uh, caucuses, Mr. Yeah, Speaker. Yeah, I think yeah, it's, it, this is an issue that affects every single one of us. We need to make sure that the OPS 
the private sector, and our own, our own caucuses, Mr. Order. Speaker, and the Legislative Assembly has protocols are in place because I believe that this goes way beyond one incident, of one person in one media outlet. This is a societal issue. This is a culture of the workplace issue, and I'd be happy to talk to the member opposite Thank about you. that. Well, Premier, this is a serious issue. We don't want you to play politics with it. Today, I did send letters to the House leaders to stress the importance of the issue and to formally request that we remove uh, that we move forward with the All-Party Select Committee to study the sexual harassment in the workplace. Now, yesterday. I was brought to your government's attention again for the second time the issue involving an assistant Crown attorney who was allowed to resign and given one year's salary bonus yeah. rather than the Attorney General, your own Attorney General and your government, rather than investigate the workplace harassment complaints made against him. So the problem, you know, you talk about policies, the problem is occurring uh, under your own roof. So, Premier, uh, you know, will I be receiving an affirmative response to Question. my request for an all-party select committee today? Well, Mr. Speaker, I think the member opposite knows perfectly well that uh, I can't comment on a particular case, and she keeps raising she keeps raising that one case. But here's what I believe about this issue, Mr. Speaker. I believe that this come to order. That this issue affects every single member of our society. I believe that no matter where we work, no matter where we live, we have to take action ourselves. We have we have legislative frameworks, Mr. Speaker. We have regulatory frameworks. We have policies, and I am in the process of making sure that those policies are in place across government. But the reality is that if every one Thanks, of us sir. in this house doesn't look to our own practice and doesn't look to our own colleagues and takes responsibility for our own action, then we will not make the cultural change Order. that's necessary, Mr. Speaker. So I'm saying to the member opposite that I'm going to ask the house, my House leader to raise this issue to make sure that across this House we have the correct policy. Thank you. Any questions? The member from Sonora, Rainy River. Thank you, Speaker. To the Premier. Today, over 30 elected officials from municipalities and First Nation communities across the Rainy River District have travelled 1,800 kilometres and are here at Queen's Park to tell the Premier what her government should have already done, which is take leadership of the Cross Route Forest so that the Fort Francis Craft Mill can reopen and put people back to work. They are literally fighting for the future of the Rainy River District. Premier, this is a needless problem that has a very simple solution. We have a mill, we have more than enough wood, and we have a potential buyer. All we need to make this deal happen is for your government to reallocate this wood and tell Expera, the potential buyer, that we want their business. Premier, will you do that today? Mr. Speaker, thank you. Well, once again, the premise of the question is that if there was an enhanced sustainable forest license in place, that a deal could have been consummated between the two parties. Speaker, I personally don't believe that that would have guaranteed anything. It doesn't mean we're not trying to work in that regard. What I would say to the member is security of supply was not the issue. There was a supply agreement offered to the minister of the member from Timmins, James Bay, will come to order. 740. For the second time, the, mem the member from Timmins, James Bay, will come to order. Last time. Finish, please. Speaker, there was a supply agreement offered to the company that was interested in purchasing the facility of 740,000 cubic meters per year. That's allowed under the terms of the existing sustainable forest license. So security of tenure was not at issue. The enhanced sustainable forestry license piece, Answer. once again, would not necessarily have guaranteed anything. The mill is privately owned, and that's, Speaker, where it sits today. We still continue to look for opportunities on behalf of the community of Fort Francis. Thank you. Speaker, this is not a business-to-business -business problem, as the Minister of Natural Resources states. The only business-to-business -business dealings that are being made pertain to the physical mill structure. The biggest holdup to this deal is the wood allocation, wood that belongs to the people of this province. This wood doesn't belong to a company. It is our wood, and it should be used to keep our local people working. 
Premier, you can fix this problem with the stroke of a pen. We have three weeks to get this right before the mill assets are damaged by not being heated this winter. Premier, will you fix this injustice for the people of Fort Francis and put our deserving town back to work before it's too late? Minister. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Thank you. Minister. Well, Speaker, once again, I fundamentally disagree. It was a business-to-business -business deal that was trying to be negotiated between someone who privately owns a mill and someone who is trying to purchase potentially the mill and get other assets to reopen the facility. MNRF staff and MNDM staff were there at the table guiding the process only. It was not our deal to be made. We were trying to do what we could to help. I would say to the member and to the members of the third party who are interested in thinking that the ESFL process would have necessarily guaranteed a deal, that today, currently, in the member's riding, there are companies that want to see an SFL put in place for their particular operation so that they can reopen and create more jobs in the members' community. So, Speaker, there is no perfect system when it comes to tenure. We've made a commitment through legislation to move forward with modernization. That is occurring. Yes, but at the end of the day, it does not guarantee that we can land a deal between a business and a business. Speaker, yes. that is unfortunately the reality. Your question, the member from Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Education. We all know that a nutritious breakfast is critical to the success of every child's development. Eating a healthy breakfast has lasting physical, mental health and educational benefits. And this morning, the Minister of Education and the Minister of Children and Youth Services joined St. Joseph's College with the students for a nutritious start to their day. The Minister also helped Breakfast Club of Canada, along with a corporate sponsor, Minute Maid, celebrate the 500th Ontario Breakfast Club opening this year. A healthy morning meal is now guaranteed to 90,000 students in Ontario schools, nearly 30,000 of them in the Toronto region. Now, Minister, can you let us, this House, know what the announcement today entailed and how we are ensuring that all children have access to a healthy and nutritious breakfast? Thank you. Minister of Education. Yes, and thank you to the member from Beaches East York for his interest in this uh, very important issue. Speaker, it's a top priority for this government to ensure that students are starting off their day with the support they need to succeed, and that includes breakfast. So the Breakfast Club of Canada was founded on the belief that every child has the right to succeed in life and, most of all, have the safe and reliable access to food. A healthy breakfast helps with stu be better student attendance, increased physical activity, increased self-esteem, and improved memory and cognition. Together with the Breakfast Club across Ontario, we have reached over 90,000 students, and this year, 500 schools, and you know, Speaker, 13,567,525 breakfasts have been served, and we were very helpful with our uh, uh, pleased with our partners, Breakfast Club, and MMA, to serve more this morning. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. And this is a very exciting milestone and an exciting announcement you made today. And I can tell you the success of the program is a priority for my constituents in the riding of Beaches East York. Absolutely. The club now has over 80 schools in the City of Toronto alone. And in my riding of Beaches East York, two schools take part in this excellent program. And we know, Minister, that the benefits of the breakfast clubs go far beyond the school walls. Evidence shows that schools with programs see improvements in attendance, punctuality, as well as in behaviour and concentration, and they help turn young people into better citizens. Minister, can you please tell us how our government is helping to support the Breakfast Club with their initiative to provide nutritious breakfasts to students across Ontario? Thank you, Minister. Minister of Children and Youth Services. Minister of Children and Youth Services. Thank you, Speaker. It was great to be at the Breakfast Club 500th uh, opening of uh, Breakfast Club of Canada. It was great. Minister Sandals was pouring the milk. I was pouring the juice and handing the fruit out. It's good to know we have other jobs if you need it. Um, but Speaker, it is a really great program, and thanks to our partners for making that happen. And our government, as you know, Speaker, announced an investment of $32 million over the next three years as part of our five-year plan to expand and enhance our student nutrition program. And in addition, 
additional $10.3 million will be invested in the program in this year and next. So the total funding is $31 million, Speaker. That's 340 new breakfast programs, and it is to establish uh, programs Answer. where there are higher needs. So it's very focused. 56,000 more children. It's fantastic. We're committed to making sure Students Ontario start their day Thank off you. right. Thank you, Speaker. No question. The member from Lampton Kent Middlesex. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. My question this morning is to the Minister of Citizenship, Immigration and International Trade. Minister, as you know, the role of the Fairness Commissioner is to make sure that everyone who is qualified to practice in a regulated profession can get a license to practice here in the province of Ontario. Minister, we have learned that in the last 15 months, the Fairness Commissioner, Jean Augustine, has expensed over $3,400 in limousine rides to Ontario's taxpayers. Minister, nothing is too small for this government's appointee to expense. On a flight to Halifax, she even billed taxpayers $3.40 for her airplane headphones. Clearly, the e-health and Pan Am style of entitlement is alive and well in this ministry. Minister, why are you allowing the Fairness Question. Commissioner these entitlements at taxpayers' expense, or do you agree with them? This is citizenship, immigration, and international trade. Thank you, thank you uh, very much for the question, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the Ontario Fairness Commission is an arm's length agency of the Ministry of Citizenship, Immigration, and International Trade. We have no involvement in the day to day operation of her office. Speaker, the Government of Ontario has a number of rules and regulations regarding serious? expense account put in place to protect the people no. of Ontario. The member from Dufferin Caledon come to order. Across all levels of government, including agencies. Speaker, we expect everyone to address to these rules, particularly those in a position of authority, whom we respect to set a positive example for others to follow. Thank you, Speaker. Well, uh, speaker, back to the minister. Minister, you should also know that while on a $6,300 trip to Finland last September, this appointee made taxpayers cover the cost of a personal sightseeing tour. Of the environment. We all know that the Fairness Commissioner was appointed in exchange for giving up her seat to the failed federal Liberal leader, Michael Ignatia. Speaker, this government talks about transparency, yet the only way we were able to learn about this shocking abuse of public money was through a freedom of information request. Minister, it doesn't seem like the Fairness Commissioner is being very fair to taxpayers in this province. Minister, will you order her to post her expenses online, or are you going to continue to allow her to abuse taxpayers' dollars by expensing limo rides? Airplane headphones and sightseeing tours. Question. Thank you, Minister. Thank you, thank you, Speaker, again for Shame the question. You. Again, the, Speaker, the Office of the Fairness Shame. Commissioner is an arm's length agency of the Government of Ontario. However, like all agencies, Speaker, under the Agency Accountability and Establishment Directive, it must comply with the guidelines set out in the Travel Mill and hospitality expenses directive and other spending guidelines. Speaker, these guidelines have been communicated to the Office of the Fairness Commissioner. The Fairness Commissioner has a mandate to ensure that the regulated professions in Ontario have practices that are transparent, objective and fair when determining who is allowed to practice in these professions. Speaker, the office is accountable Answer. for using government funds with effective effectiveness and economy for the purpose of fulfilling this mandate. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker. Question, the member from London West. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Speaker, the last few months have shown that sexual violence for women and impunity for powerful men remains a reality in Ontario. Today, we learned that doctors can sexually assault women during examinations and return to practice medicine without requiring the College of Physicians to inform the police. And if you are a Crown attorney facing sexual harassment allegations, the government will give you double your annual salary as severance. All you have to do is resign. 
Can the government explain what it will do to end this culture of impunity and create an Ontario where sexual harassment and sexual assault allegations are taken seriously and acted upon? So, Mr. Speaker, as I, as I have already indicated in response to a couple of other questions, this is something that I and our government take very, very seriously. As I hope everyone in this legislature takes seriously, Mr. Speaker. So whether it's at work or at home or in the community, whether it's public service or private sector, um, we all have to be vigilant in terms of our practice. There are rules and regulations in place. In fact, Mr. Speaker, in 2009, our government actually brought in changes to strengthen the Occupational Health and Safety Act to address workplace violence and harassment. So, Mr. Speaker, um, we will continue to we'll continue to monitor the legislation and the rules, Mr. Speaker. But I would say to the member opposite, I think it goes beyond that. I think it goes beyond the frameworks that are in place that have to continually be improved, and we have to look to our own Absolutely. practice. We have to look to our own communities and our own workplaces and make sure that we have the practices and behaviors in place in those places that keep our ourselves and our colleagues safe. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, beyond monitoring, there are specific ways this government could address violence and harassment faced by women now. For example, yesterday we heard that some journalism students were warned against internships at Q with Gian Gomeshi. We know that interns are vulnerable. They fear reprisals or damage to their careers if they report inappropriate or even illegal conduct by their employers. I've tabled a bill that would allow interns to anonymously report inappropriate conduct. This is one simple measure the government can take now. But much more needs to be done to make violence prevention an all-of-government priority. Will this government move immediately to update Ontario's Sexual Violence Action Plan to include real goals, real funding, and real Question. progress so that it offers real protection for women today? Minister responsible for women's issues. The minister responsible for women's issues. Thank you, Speaker. And as the Premier said, sexual violence and abuse of any kind is a very serious issue. We all take it uh, seriously. I find it completely unacceptable, and it is something that we all have to think about here in the legislature and workplaces and beyond because sexual violence has a devastating impact. And we have many initiatives and programs. We have a $15 million sexual violence action plan. We also have additional money to support sexual assault centers. And I want to say here what I said outside the House, Speaker. If people are facing abuse, I encourage them to go to the authorities if they can. I encourage them to go to support groups if they can. I encourage them to go to the, their unions if they can. And there's many protections. Interns are covered by the Human Rights Code and employer policies. Um, there are uh, many, many progressive policies, Speaker, in workplaces that require employers to respond to formal and informal complaints of abuse. It's something we all have to take seriously. Yep. We're working on it. We'll continue to invest in this. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. On August 4th, extreme flooding hit my riding of Burlington, as well as areas in the riding of my colleague, the member from Halton. The City of Burlington received nearly 200 millimetres of rain in five hours. That is equal to the total rainfall usually received in the months of July and August. This flash flood caused damage to more than 3,000 homes throughout Burlington. In August, Burlington City Council passed a resolution requesting assistance under the private component of ODRAP for assistance to individuals for essential expenses not otherwise covered by insurance. The City of Burlington has been working together with Holton Region to help the people of Burlington affected by this natural disaster. Mr. Speaker, I am so proud of the community spirit that has flourished throughout Burlington as a result of this extremely successful fundraising on behalf of those Question. who need it most. Minister, will you please provide an update on the status of Burlington's application? Thank, thank you. you. Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Well, Mr. Speaker, I want to thank the uh, member uh, from Burlington and also the member from Halton uh, for keeping uh, our ministry apprised of what's been going on there, the tremendous community efforts. Um, speaker, I know how difficult it is uh, for communities to try to deal uh, with disasters, and uh, in that context, it's our government's first priority to ensure that residents are made safe in the event of a disaster. The Old Draft program, Speaker, is provided uh, to communities where damages exceed the financial resources of the affected individuals and municipalities. In the case of Burlington, the most severe damage 
was felt by individuals. Uh, when reimbursing individuals, Old Draft's role was to ensure that essential needs like access to housing, food, Answer. medical response and heating are met. So I look forward to being kept apprised and uh, hopefully we'll have some news soon on the application. Thank you. Supplementary. The member from Hull. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I, too, saw the extensive flood damage and felt the frustration of my constituents living in the Burlington part of my community. I knocked on residents' doors with officials assessing the devastation and saw firsthand the widespread destruction in some neighbourhoods, flooded basements, waterlogged furniture, and garbage bags full of ruined clothing. Perhaps most memorable, though, were the stories of loss and the looks of despair on people's faces as they dealt with the flood destruction. Mr. Speaker, confusion often surrounds the decisions which designate some communities eligible for ODRAP and denies others this assistance. Eligibility requirements are dependent on the particular characteristics of a given disaster event, and this can lead to assumptions that the program is inconsistently administered. The length of time required for provincial funds to flow is also under scrutiny. Mr. Speaker, how does the minister question. plan to respond to the many questions that often surround the Ontario Disaster Assistance Program? Thank you, Minister. Well, Speaker, I uh, certainly agree with the uh, member's observation uh, that our climate is changing. In fact, a little, uh, perhaps a little known fact, 28% of all insurance uh, claims uh, settled today are uh, categorized as a response to a catastrophic weather event. Wow. Um, her thoughtful comments and her hard work uh, have led us uh, to do exactly what our mandate letter, my mandate letter, calls me to do, and that's to look at the old draft program and to review it to make sure it meets the needs of local communities who experience disasters. Good idea. And I continue to welcome input from all members of the House uh, in that regard. Um, we're going to examine the findings of uh, our formal review, scheduled for completion next spring, and uh, hopefully, Mr. Speaker, as a result of that, be in a better position to help Answer. communities uh, experiencing uh, climate change disasters. Thank you. New questions. Member from Bruce Perry, Owen South. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is the Premier. Ever since four Orange Crew members regrettably died, the Ontario public has been looking to you to do two specific things. One, stop denying the facts, and two, start accepting responsibility. Right. Yesterday, your Deputy Premier told a CBC reporter that she did not know about the problems at Orange until October 2011. Oh May I remind you that on May 3, 2011, the Ontario Air Transport, Transport Association sent her a five-page letter alerting her to the egregious concerns at Orange and urging her to act as rapidly as possible. We have now learned that her response to them was, I'm too busy to discuss Orange. Premier, your deputy hasn't been truthful. She said she didn't know before October 2011, yeah. but her reply to the Air Transport Association letter proves different. Um, I'm going to caution the member and ask him to withdraw that one comment, please. Premier, will you do the right thing and ask for her resignation today? Premier. Speaker, I know the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care is going to want to comment on this, but we've got new leadership at Orange a new CEO, we have a new board of directors, and we have a new senior management team at Orange, Mr. Speaker. It was our deputy premier who put those changes in place, Mr. Speaker. She did that. When the minister and our government learned of the issues coming out of Orange, we took action, Mr. Speaker. That is the reality. That's what happened, and that's why there are so many changes at Orange, because this deputy premier, when she was minister of health, she took those actions, Mr. Speaker. We now have a piece of legislation in front of this House. We hope that the uh, members opposite will support us in getting that legislation passed because it will make further changes in oversight to Orange, Mr. Speaker. And we, Answer. we really do trust that given the urgency coming from the other side, that they will work with us to get that legislation passed as soon as possible. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Back to the Premier. What the second Orange Report really boils down to is an issue of ministerial and first ministerial responsibility. That's what this is about. Accountability. What the public expects and demands is that you and your minister accept responsibility for the mismanagement and boondoggle of Orange. They want to know if you think it's appropriate for a minister in these circumstances to have not just stayed on, but to have been also promoted. Just a few minutes ago in this House, Premier, you asked for responsibility and said we should all be taking responsibility in this House. As such, I want to know about your standards. How many more people have to die, Premier, before you ask for that minister's resignation? Premier. 
Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Well, Mr. Speaker, it was nearly two years ago, in fact, when we introduced Bill 11, which was the Air Ambulance Amendment Act, to further improve oversight at Orange, Mr. Speaker. And the bill was sent to committee in April of last year, but it was more than a year ago, Mr. Speaker, but it was the PCs at that time who refused to allow hearings on that important act. And the bill, as we all know, was left on the order paper, Mr. Speaker, when both the PCs and the NDP refused to support the budget and forced an election. So, Mr. Speaker, we want as the pre- uh, Let's just come to order. Finish, please. Wrap up. So, Mr. Speaker, we're proud of the changes that our Deputy Premier has made the to the member from Hamilton to East Stony Creek come to, to make, And that's why we're looking forward to the, both opposition parties supporting us. We've reintroduced the elements of that act under Answer. the Accountability and Transparency, Transparency Act. I hope that the opposition will work with us to get those important changes approved as soon as possible. Here, here. No question, member from Timmins, James Bay. My question is to the Premier. Premier, you will know that your House Leader has moved a time allocation motion in order to move the daycare bill in such a way that the public will not have a chance to have their say outside of the City of Toronto. Shame. Now, you're the Premier that says that you want to have a conversation with Ontarians. You're the Premier that says you want to include the voices of people across Ontario in whatever this government does. We moved the motion this morning to allow the committee to travel five days five days outside of Toronto in order to hear the voices of the people of Ontario. My question to you is this. Will you support our motion and allow the voices of those people outside of this area to be heard on this issue? I do. House Leader. Thank you very much, Speaker. I thank the, the member opposite for the question. Uh, Speaker, uh, this, this is a very important bill. This bill is about uh, protecting our children, Speaker. Uh, this bill, the core essence of this bill is to make sure that our kids are safe when somebody else is looking after uh, our children. I speak, uh, Speaker, as a parent. Uh, and that's why, Speaker, we cannot take any more chances uh, in, in terms of tragedies that could be, could be uh, traumatic or, or fatal for our children. That is why the, the Minister of Education, Speaker, had tabled this bill some time ago in the previous parliament to ensure that we move ahead with protecting oh, our children, making sure that our children are getting the best possible care. The kind of attention, Answer. Speaker, that we have put in our schools, we need to make sure, make sure that when it comes to child care, our children are safe at all times. Thank That's you. what parents are asking us for to do, and we need to do that by Thank passing you. this bill. Thank you. Well, you say that you're a parent, a parent from Ottawa, and any parent in Ottawa will not get a chance to speak to this bill. So the question is simply this. Your government, under the leadership of this Premier, says you want to hear from Ontarians. We want to engage in conversations with people across this province. We agree. We believe it's important to hear the voices of people from Ottawa, of people from Northern Ontario, people from the Southwest and others when it comes to important issues such as daycare. So our question is simply this. Will this government support a motion that will allow the voices of the Member people Lanes, of, of Ontario, Ontario, outside of Toronto, to be able to be heard on this issue so that their thoughts, their reflections can be seen in the final product of this bill? What the what? Thank you. Speaker, uh, speaker, I ask the opposition to start to stop playing politics when it comes to the lives and the protection of our children. Speaker, this bill at its heart, at its core, it's at its mandate is about protecting our children. And partisanship should not be the one that should trump the safety and the security of our children when they are being looked after by somebody else uh, within our community. And some of you are not even in your own chairs. Don't insult the kids. Finish and wrap up, please. Thank you, Speaker. I, I love the Minister of Education for, for bringing a very extensive piece of legislation uh, based on very substantive consultations that she took place. That's why this bill was tabled, Speaker, almost a year ago, and have an Thank ample you. debate. We need to make sure that we protect our kids. New question. The member from Ottawa remains. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Morning is for the Minister of Norton Development and Mines. Mr. Speaker, just last week, Ontario Mining Association hosted their annual Meet the Miners Day at Queen's Park. 
Plusieurs d'entre nous, moi-même et many of us, myself included, were very happy and proud to participate in the, this event and to learn about the exceptional role that they play in our province, in our daily, in the daily events of our province. In mine financing, geology and engineering, stable exploration and mining industries, and as one of the lowest mining tax rates in Canada. And we have the advantage of a strong economy, competitive business costs, and world research and development environment. Monsieur le Président, can the Minister inform the House on the status of the mining industry in Ontario and its significance to our provincial economy? Merci beaucoup to the member for a really important question. And may I say, on a day when uh, the official opposition is, uh, is talking down the positive aspects of the economy, I think it's important that we get the facts out about the uh, mining industry. It was a great uh, gathering of Meet the Miners last week, and I think it's important to state that despite certainly the challenges within the sector, Ontario continues to be the leading jurisdiction in the country for both the exploration and the production of minerals in Canada, and certainly a major player across the world. And it plays an incredibly important part in our provincial economy. Speaker, the mining sector directly employs some 26,000 workers. And in 2013, the value of mineral production in Ontario was $9.8 billion dollars. Ontario's mining Answer. supply and services sector, um, 50,000 workers employed, $10 billion in output. I'll look forward to giving you more details during my supplementary. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. For government's plan to build Ontario up by creating a dynamic and supportive environment where business can prosper. The minister has made it clear that our government is doing just that when it comes to the mining sector. The global mining economy is evolving and new competition is always emerging. I know our government is committed to ensuring that Ontario remains a world leader in mineral exploration and mining investment. Monsieur le Président, can the minister tell the House what our government is doing to maximize Ontario's mineral potential and support a modern and innovative industry ensuring that Ontario's mining sector continue to thrive Question. for decades to come. Merci. Uh, well, that's Le just ministre. another great question, Mr. Speaker. I mean, being certainly armed with a with a spectrum of solid data, well-researched information is crucial to an industry that requires uh, innovation, and our, and our understanding of the industry requires us to move forward. And that's why our ministry certainly partnered with the Ontario Mining Association and another organization to provide support for research in that sector. Two reports were released last week, uh, one from the Ontario Mining Association, uh, which actually spoke to the direct economic impact of a gold mine. It's a remarkable story. The details are worth getting into. I know I don't have time for that. And there was also a, a great report by the uh, Canadian Association for Mining Equipment and Services for Export, Kamisi, as it is known by those of us in the sector, which actually uh, talked about the incredible economic impacts of the mining supply and services sector, which I referenced earlier, as being up to 50,000 people employed and over $10 billion yes, of total value input. It's a great story in the sector. Lots of challenges, but we're working and focusing on everything, and may I say, including work going forward on the Ring of Fire. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the minister responsible for infrastructure. Why is it taking the minister so long to put together the list of infrastructure projects which he needs to submit to the federal government to receive funding under the Building Canada Plan? Sir of Economic Development, Employment and Infrastructure. Mr. Speaker, I, I used to be a hockey player, and when I went into the corners and somebody had their elbows up, they always got a little taste of the stick. And I want to, I want to, I want, I want to, uh, I want to put that uh, analogy to use here. The federal minister of finance, Mr. S Mr. Speaker, was being very disingenuous yesterday when he suggested incorrectly that Ontario was in any way holding up the Building Canada Fund. In fact, Mr. Speaker, since March, 
We've been waiting for documents from the federal government that ironically came two afters, hours after I spoke out yesterday. So, Mr. Speaker, the Minister of Finance federally may be very embarrassed by this. The fact is, Mr. Speaker, that we're going to continue to invest in infrastructure, and he should be embarrassed when you look at the comparison between the federal investment in infrastructure compared to ours. We're investing $130 billion Answer. over the next 10 years. The federal government's only investing $70 billion, Mr. Speaker, and that includes their own billions through the whole country. Thank you. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, even with all the bluster that the minister can muster, he cannot deny that there are nearly $11 billion on the table set aside to support infrastructure projects in the province of Ontario. This government has insisted time and time again that infrastructure spending is their priority. They've made promise after promise, improved public transit in Toronto, all-day two-way GO service through my riding, high-speed rail between London and Toronto, the Ring of Fire, the list goes on and on. Yet Alberta, Nova Scotia, New Brunswick and Manitoba have all submitted their lists. This minister continues to drag his feet. Will this government get its act together and commit to getting its list of preferred infrastructure projects to the minister federal government finance by order. week's end? Thank you. Mr. Speaker, I know it might be a little embarrassing for the member to have been so misinformed by his federal cousins, but the fact of the matter is, Mr. Speaker, since March we've been waiting for a draft agreement from the federal government, and it's going to come, Mr. Speaker. We were notified two hours after we spoke out yesterday, refuting the incorrect information that the federal minister had. Mr. Speaker, the fact of the matter is we were the first province in this country uh, to provide uh, municipal infrastructure projects, Mr. Speaker, an application process for small municipalities, the first in the country. We're eager to move forward with this program, Mr. Speaker. All we've asked for, Mr. Speaker, is the draft agreement from the federal government, Mr. Speaker. We've been asking since March. We haven't had it. Within two hours of us speaking out yesterday, Answer. miraculously, it's going to come. Mr. Speaker, we'll keep working with the federal government, despite the fact that they're so undercharging infrastructure in this province, Mr. Speaker. Their contributions are. Please. The uh, member from Leeds, Grenville, on a point of order. Uh, thank you very much, Speaker. On a point of order, I just feel it's very important that Hansard reflect that as of June 15, 2010, the Occupational Health and Safety Act requires all employers to have a policy regarding workplace harassment, which includes sexual harassment. Our caucus has one. What we need is a select committee. Um, that is not a point of order, and I should have jumped up a little quicker. The member from Dufferin Caledon on a point of order. Speaker, I was remiss during um, introduction of guests. I see that the mayor elect for the town of Caledon, Alan Thompson, has joined us, and I would like everyone to join and welcome. Yeah, a member from uh, Kenora Rainy River on a point of order. Uh, yes, thank you, Speaker. I know it's hard to believe, but I think it's possible I may have left out one or two of my constituents. And I know uh, I'm pretty sure I missed out on uh, on Ken Perry, and there may there may have been some others. And if I did overlook anyone, I do sincerely apologize. I welcome uh, everyone who has made the long journey here today. Thank you, the member from Bruce Owen Sound on a point of order. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to uh, again add to the roster that the uh, family of our colleague Michael Harris, Sarah Murphy, and Lincoln Harris all joined us in the uh, members' gallery. I think they might have just slipped out, but they were here watching question period. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Speaker. There are no deferred votes. This House stands recessed until 3 p.m. this afternoon.